Hey everybody, Jonathan Fields. I'm pretty psyched to be here today with a friend of mine, Stephen Key. And Steve and I hooked up, I think it was maybe a couple of years ago, um, because I was trying to figure out, is there some other way to just be the guy who builds the business and the machines and creates everything and invests a zillion dollars? And is there some way to actually take my ideas, because I'm a bit of an idea terrorist, and actually just create ideas and figure out how to work them and build revenue around them? And Stephen's name just popped up as sort of like the man to turn to. So um, Stephen, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. So, um, so uh, you are the leading guru, you know, that I know of, maybe on the inter intergalactic guru on this whole wacky black box art of something called licensing, which is a completely different thing. You know, most entrepreneurs really figure you got to take the big risk, spend a lot of money, a zillion hours take your idea and bring it to market. And that's what scares the daylights out of so many people. But you had this completely different approach. Well, it scares me. <laughs> and I, I never wanted to take a lot of risk. I'm one, I call myself a no-risk entrepreneur. And I found a way of bringing my ideas to, to market without you know, taking out a bank loan or borrowing money from family or even reading a business plan, <laughs> none of that stuff. And it's basically coming up with an idea and renting it to a company that can take your idea, bring it to the market, put it on the store shelf really fast, and they do all the heavy lifting. But you still have to do a couple things. You still have to be smart about it. But you have to find an opportunity, and that's what I've been doing for about 30 years. So, oh, so only 30 years, so you're kind of new to this whole field. But. Well, I know I, I know. I look like I'm in my mid-30s, I know. But of course. I, you know, I started doing this because I... I wanted to be creative, and I really wanted to work for myself. And but I didn't. Um, I, you know, basically I went to Santa Clara University. And I took a business class. I was going to be a business major, and I thought this isn't for me whatsoever. <laughs> took an art class and realized I really like to work with my hands. So I just started making things. And I went down to the store and I realized the products were they weren't that great, mm -hmm. and thought I could do a little bit better. And I just thought that if I came up with a good idea, showed it to a company, naturally they would pay me for uh, my ideas, and they did. And I didn't really think of it as licensing or renting an idea. I just thought, gee, if I can show them an opportunity, and if they liked it, they would pay me, and they did. Okay, so this is, and, and we're going to get into in more detail what licensing is and sort of how it works, but one of the first things, and I, I know you've dealt with this question over and over, but and, and my knowledge base around licensing is, is, is pretty slim, but whenever I broach the subject with people, th there's this giant red flag and a huge question which always comes up, which, which is like, they're going to steal my idea. You know, like, well, how, how do I protect myself? You know, and so many people shut down because they're freaked out about losing control of their idea or people ripping off their idea. Yeah, I don't, you hear these stories, Jonathan, but it hasn't happened to me. Only one time, and I'll talk about this one time, but... Basically, I think companies are looking for ideas and they realize it's easier to pay someone a royalty than pay people in the back room a salary. I mean, it's, it's called open innovation. And if we open our doors and we go out and we, we ask people, do you have a great idea? We, it's a multiplying effect. Even Procter & Gamble's doing it. They, they put on their website, this is what we're looking for. Hmm. They've been able to, to lower their their R&D costs, they brought more products to market with that open innovation business model now. So, can you imagine a company stealing ideas, how fast that information gets out to everybody? Mm -hmm. So, given that we have the internet today, where, you know, you, can, you used to be able, you could tell your friends or your family, but now you can tell millions that, hey, someone treated you, you know, someone did something that wasn't appropriate. So, because of open innovation, companies looking for ideas, and because of the internet, and because it's really speed to market now, mm. meaning everybody thought you had to own something, you had to have a patent. And I'm here to say that's not necessarily true. It's perceived ownership. Mm. And you can grab that perceived ownership with a trademark, copyright, or even a provisional patent application, which you can file yourself for $110. They're fantastic tools. You can read all about them at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. But realize these tools level the playing field for all of us to play. So you yeah. need to get rid of that fear, kick it to the curb, and realize 
It's not good business to take somebody else's idea, number one. And number two, use those tools. They're very affordable. We all can use it and get those ideas to companies. But here's the catch. You've got to pick up the phone and call companies. Right. Yeah, and, and you also, and I'll, I'll, I want to get back right back to that, but you also brought up the U.S. Um, uh, you know, the Patent Trademark Office website. I have to tell you, I, I've, yeah, in a very past life, I was a federal employee. And when most people think about like a federal government website, they're just they're, they, it terrifies them. You know, like they're this hard. The, the USPTO website is actually really good and very navigable and user friendly. It's very user friendly, and you realize, come on, they're in the business of of supplying these tools for us. Yeah. So they got call them up. Great customer service. It's a business, everybody. So you should call them up, ask questions. They're wonderful. Dave Campos is the head guy over there. And uh, it's a great, it's absolutely fantastic. And I was scared at the very beginning, too, that they were trying to keep these things from me, that if you filed a patent, they weren't going to give it to me. But the truth of the matter, they're there to help us. And, and those tools help businesses start up. Right. And it gives them this perceived ownership. It, it allows you to play a really big game. So, no, you should, anybody should go to the USPTO.gov. Check it out. Kick the tires. It's a great. Uh, it's a great place. Yeah. So let's deconstruct what what we're really talking about with licensing right here, so people really understand what it is. Um, you know, and and I guess it starts out with an idea. You know, that fundamentally you've got to have a good idea, and then kind of like walk. Well, give me sort of like a, a quick framework of like what are the major steps that happen from there that that makes it so different from traditional entrepreneurship. Okay, I I break it down in ten steps. And I've been educating, I've been using my 10 steps for years, and I've been helping others, you know, walk down this road with 10 steps. And basically what you're doing, you're finding an opportunity. And the way I do it, I walk down to the store and I just look at the aisle, I look in the aisle at a certain category that I'm passionate about. I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, guitar picks. I love it. If you walk down, there you go. If you walk down to a traditional music store and you looked at guitar picks, you would see a lot of guitar picks, different, maybe a couple different sizes, shapes, thickness, material. But what was missing? And when I went down there, I looked, I didn't see any lifestyle. I didn't see a simple change of the shape that I saw an opportunity. It was like a sleeping dinosaur. Why does it have to be a certain material? And why couldn't we change the shape? And so I let the market kind of give me the, uh, the picture of, hey, come up with something new. And so we did. We came up with guitar picks in the shapes of Mickey Mouse and skulls and vampires. And we sold about 20 million guitar picks at Walmart, 7-Eleven, everywhere. So the first thing you need to do is come up with something that's a little different. Mm -hmm. Do not think you need to create or, or reinvent the, the wheel. So a lot of times it's really, it's not this massive thing. It's kind of looking at what's there already and saying, can I do it a little bit differently? Can it, like, is there some offshoot of this? Or like, can I tweak it in a way which would completely change the demand dynamics? Yeah, a small change is better than a big change. A big change, it takes a lot of money, a lot of education. That takes time. Find that small little improvement. And that's what I do. So I really invent for the marketplace. And I study the marketplace first. I just go down to the store and I take a look around at a category I, I, I'm passionate about. And what, you, what you're going to find that these big companies do miss things. Mm -hmm. And because we're a consumer, because we know what we like and we don't like, we can play this game. And I think sometimes it's better if, you know, if you're not an expert in any particular field. Like, I don't play guitar. So it's someone, my partner, when we were doing this, he did play the guitar. And so when I came up with the idea of changing the shape, he was like, no way, don't do that. Heresy. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's really the first step. And then the second step would be to uh, do a Google product search, look around to see if it is a new idea. But Jonathan, even if I find it somewhere, some remote place, I don't care. Because I just go down to the store and see, is it on the store shelf? Hmm. And that's the way I like to, to look at it. So find an opportunity, find that small change. And then the next thing I like to do is, is file some type of protection. And it's really perceived ownership. Because I don't think you really own anything. I think anything can be argued in court. 
And, and I've been in court before. I've been in federal court. I sued a small little company, a small little toy company, uh, Legos. Maybe you've heard of it. And what I realized at the end of the day, we were just going to argue over words. So it's best just to file a trademark, copyright, original patent application, all the tools that are available to us, and, and have some perceived ownership. And from that point, then start calling companies. Right. So, so I, I'm fascinated by the guitar pick example, too. Maybe we could follow this through a little bit, right? Because one of the other things that pops into my head with that is if you are, you're using the shapes or the images of these pre-existing characters, like you were saying, Disney-based things, so does that mean that you now have to go to Disney and, and sort of figure this out with them? Well, you're absolutely right. The first one we launched was a skull mm -hmm. because I went down to Hot Topic and I noticed that kids were wearing all these skulls. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one we launched. We took it to a trade show. It was a big hit. And then I realized, what other shapes could it be? And I thought, well, gee, you know, why not Mickey Mouse? So I just called Disney up and asked for someone in their licensing department and someone picked up the phone and I said, look, I sell guitar picks in the shapes of skulls. How about one in the shape of Mickey Mouse? And the guy said, yeah, why not? <laughs> and it was that simple and we talked about, you know, how to cut that deal, what the royalty rates were. It was really quite simple. I had worldwide rights and exclusive rights with guitar picks in the shape of Mickey Mouse and their movies with the lenticular lens. And, and thinking, I, I was just a small guy starting out. Why would they give me a license? Well, they, they looked at my business model. They knew that no one had ever thought about it before. And they, they gave me a license for, for three years. Yeah. yeah. So then you take, you take your idea, their license to use the Disney image. Yes. But then you have to go to another step, and you actually have to have somebody make these things and sell them and distribute them. And well, th th this was a little bit different. Okay. Uh, my background is licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tried to jump out, Jonathan. I wanted right. to try to bring a product to market myself. Ah. Okay. And so <laughs> I thought, why not a guitar pick? It only costs pennies, right? Yeah. And. And I went down that road, and what I found that it, it took about a quarter of a million dollars of my own money for something that cost pennies. It took uh, about four years. We were in 10,000 stores. We're a Walmart vendor. We won some two uh, best of show in the largest music stores. We had a, a great, a great run. Uh, had a lot of employees. I did the whole thing. Had the employees wearing all the different hats and realized it wasn't for me. Sold that business about a year ago. It was probably the best day of my life. Mm -hmm. But I had that experience. And so to know the difference between licensing and the difference between manufacturing and yourself, they are very, they are completely different. One has a lot of risk. You have to, you, you do all the work. The other one is that you find an opportunity, find a company that's already in the marketplace, show it to them, and they take it to the market for you. Right. But I don't think I could have licensed the guitar picks anyway, because it was so different, so weird. They would look and go, "Why? Why is that going to work?" So it was easier to get it up and running and then sell it, or even license it. I could have, right. but it was easy to do it afterwards. But they're very, very different. But I think the point I was making earlier is I found an opportunity, right? And it was a small, it was a small change. It wasn't a real big change. It was very small. So, and, and, and the traditional path for most of the other stuff that you've done, though, would be that you, you would take that idea and then get some form of preliminary protection for it, and then you go to somebody else and you say, you know, like, talk, talk to me about what the conversation, what, what does the deal look like with that, your licensing partner? Okay, I'll give you an example. I came up with uh, a basketball game. I, I had a terrible name for it, by the way. I called it Hoop Hoop Parade. It was a kid's basketball game. And I went down to Toys R Us and I looked at the whole category and I noticed that all the backboards were square and I noticed this one particular one, it had a small picture of Michael Jordan I love playing basketball mm -hmm. and, and I just took the picture of Michael and slapped it on the backboard and had the backboard in the shape of Michael Jordan. Simple change again, sent it to Ohio Art that had the license for Michael Jordan to put on basketball games for kids. 
And basically, three days later, I had a licensing agreement. It sold for 10 years. Hmm. And there was no protection whatsoever. And because this company, Ohio Art, is, it is the toy industry. And they've been working with outside inventors for many, many years. So they're prepared. When, when they see an idea, they like it. They don't care if there's patent protection whatsoever. Because they realize it's really first to market, get it out there fast, and ideas go in and, the, in and out of the market so quick. Right. So the, the deal that was cut, it was really quite simple. They pay you, every time they sell one, they pay you a royalty on the wholesale price. And that particular life, that particular product sold for 10 years. And uh, it surprised a lot of people, given that it was so minor of a change and there was no protection whatsoever. Right. So, so that, I mean, and my curiosity was, you know, like, what does the average percentage look like? So you were saying you get a percent, your licensing fee is a percentage of the wholesale price. Is there a standard range or does it just completely depend on the deal? Uh, there's a standard range. I think the two questions you need to ask a company are basically how many units you think you can sell and what the wholesale price is, which your royalty will be based on. So if you know those two things, and even if they don't want to tell you how many they think they could sell, all, all you need to do is ask them how many stores are they currently in and figure out one, one a week. Because if you cannot sell one a week, they'll keep you to the curb pretty quick. So if you know those numbers, you can look at how much, what's the revenue to, that you're going to bring in. The average rate, I would say, is anywhere from 3% to maybe 7%. I like to always shoot for 5 so I'll ask for 7 But you have to really look at those two numbers first, or that the, the really your revenue, because maybe you, you don't need a 5%. For instance, I've got a technology that's on packaging. It's called spin formation. And if I were to let, if, if, in a million years, if I could put it on Coca-Cola, they do a billion Cokes a day. So your royalty rate would have to be very, very small. Right. So it, it all varies. So it's really, yeah, so it's going to depend largely on the volume and the price point, it sounds yeah. like. Um, but I'm, and you know, I'm, I'm running quick numbers in my head here, and I'm thinking, okay, if you have... Uh, you come up with an idea, and you know, for something that turns into a product which is like, you know, a ten dollar wholesale product, and you're getting five okay. percent on that, and that you know that, and you just walk away basically, and the company goes, they take the risk, they manufacture, they bring it to market, and they start selling millions of units a year. That's a nice chunk of change in your pocket for essentially coming up with an idea. It can add up real quickly. I the field, the category that I like, I'm in packaging, where I have a little a label that's on products now and. You know, we've sold, you know, 500 million labels. And every time they sell one, most people have never even seen it. But every time they sell one, I get paid. You're right. It can add up very, very quickly. But people need to realize, if you're into this because you want to get rich quick, not, no, that do something else. Because this is something you should be passionate about. If you like innovation, if you like ideas, if you want to see your product on the store shelves, Absolutely. This is this is a fun, no risk way of getting into the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I like it. You don't have to quit your day job. Right. You don't have to do anything nutty. You can play this innovation game uh, on the weekends if you want to. Five right. hours a week if you want to. Yeah. So, do on, on average, um, did your? It seems like also your average product or your average idea probably has a shelf life to it, right? Are, are there many things that go on indefinitely or do things generally come in and out? I think overall they're in and out, okay? Uh, certain industries, are they're called fashion industries, like the toy industry, novelty gift. You're lucky if you get a season. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are evergreens that keep on selling year after year after year. Like the Michael Jordan sold for, for 10 years. I think that was unusual. By my one technology, my rotating labels been selling for over 12 years. So I don't think that's common. I think if you looked at most of the ideas I've licensed, they had like a three, you know, maybe five years tops. So, so it really is, it's a type of, you know, I guess the thing is, if you are doing it, like you said, just because you love to make stuff and you, let, you have ideas, it's, it, you know, the, stuff, the money you make from that is almost like a bonus. But if you're actually looking at the world of creating ideas as your business, then you would have to approach it with the understanding that I can't just, my focus isn't just to come up with one big idea. 
but I should be in constant idea creation mode. Yeah, you, you really have to. I think it's a numbers game, like anything else in life. You have to get up and you have to do it a few times. So uh, when I was doing this full steam, in fact, I have one, one technology that pretty much takes up all my time. But there was a time where I'd come up with hundreds of ideas and send them out to companies, like daily. Mm -hmm. And you build a relationship. They know you're creative. And that's why sometimes you don't need to build a prototype. You know, maybe it's a one-line description. Maybe it's a sell sheet. In fact, what I send to companies now is basically a, a one-page sell sheet that has a benefit statement at the top. Why do I care? Why do you care? Why do your customers care? And a picture of it and contact information and say, gee, are you interested? So I, 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 I think it's a numbers game at the end. And if you can come up with a lot of ideas, and if you want to be creative, it's a perfect fit for someone that just wants to be creative. And I think there's a lot of us out there that don't want to start businesses, mm -hmm. that uh, don't want to get involved in, in the risk. But I think if you have a good idea, you can get it to market really quick if you find that right partner. And let's talk about how to find that partner too. Yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Because some people are like, yeah, how, how do you find these right. guys? It's real simple. Whatever idea that you have, go down to the marketplace and, a mat, and, and, and find out exactly where it's going to be sold. You know, look at it. Go, that, it's going to be sold there on the shelf space. Then call all those companies within two to three feet. Those are your potential licensees. And those are the ones that I call. And the same, you know, I say the same thing every, every time for the last 30 years. I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, hi, my name is Stephen Key. I'm a product developer. And I'd like to submit an idea to your company. Do you take outside submissions? Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't know what to do with that. Most mm -hmm. Most companies don't, but you want to speak to someone in the marketing department, someone in the sales department, and someone that's kind of at the mid level. You don't want to, you don't want to talk to the president or vice president. Find someone that will champion your idea. Find someone that can be the Superman. Find that person that that will get promoted. Right. And product managers don't really care where a good idea comes from. So, and and then when I get them on the line. I use my one-line benefit statement. You need to be able to summarize your idea into one sentence. Like with my rotating label, it added 75% more space. Hmm. And I knew uh, all these packaging people with labels, they needed more space. So it was really easy. And I didn't go on and talk about how we were going to sell millions of labels and make them all money. Just use your one-line benefit statement and get in the door and then show them a sell sheet. And sometimes I don't even make a prototype. You know, just right. try to get a good concept in. No, and it's it's funny because when you think about how do I get into companies, how to, you know, I, I think most people who aren't exposed to this world, we just start spinning scenarios which are just you know immensely complex. But you know, when you you're sitting here telling me, no, just go to the shelf, look at the other stuff, look who's making these suckers, and call them up, and just you know ask for the you know the right the right department, and and you use that same sentence that that you've been using for thirty years, and. Uh, you know, I'm I'm curious also though. Is is there, um, is there an industry or are there like trade shows or are there places where everybody goes to aggregate to try and pitch ideas and companies go there to open them or or does that not really happen? You know, I don't think. Uh, I think going to trade shows are fantastic because everybody's gathering there, and you can pick up, you can meet the right people. So you could walk a show. I wouldn't recommend getting a booth, but you could walk a trade show, meet everybody, and then contact them later. So I think it's wonderful. I think most companies today, because of open innovation, are looking for ideas. Mm -hmm. I have a directory of over 1,400 companies that are inventor friendly, mm -hmm. that welcome you. So, and we just did that just um, for the book that's coming out. We put a directory in there for people that if they have, here are the 10 steps. Now, the, here's 1,400 companies looking for ideas. We try to put the two together. Oh, Jim, so, the, so wait, so that, that directory of 1,400 companies is in your book? Yeah. It, it was a, <laughs> That's pretty it was, sweet. <laughs> well, we thought it was, it was help, it's helpful, but I believe once you, you uh, learn the 10 steps, you, you don't need a list, <laughs> okay? Right. But, but you, here's a list, and, 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 and there, it makes it easier. I tell all my students or anybody that's starting out, Call a company where you don't even have an idea. 
Find out how easy it is. You'll be surprised. Hmm. And once you once you call them up and you say you're a product developer, you take outside submissions and they say yes, you're going to go, I can do this. <laughs> and, and so it's all about um, moving forward, not getting stuck. And you're right. A lot of people imagine all these things in their head about what's going to happen, and it's just not true. So I think... Uh, I think we all can do it because we're all consumers. We know what we like and know what we don't like. Yeah, and, and, and it sounds like also what you're saying is um, start in the areas where you have some really strong interest and where you're like you, you know the market, you know what's out there, you know what people are talking about and not talking about. Does, does that make sense? It, it does. And I, what I've found, it seems a lot of my students, uh, you know, if you just have kids, if you've got young kids, you're, you're – you're always seeing problems, right? And so that's that's a very creative time. Well, it's time in my life because my children were very young, and I know for a lot of other people too. But we're always seeing opportunities. You just have to look at them and say, what do I do with this? And you just have to take some action. And I know a lot of us come up with ideas, and we don't do anything because we don't know how. We're scared. We're going to get ripped off. How do you do it? And we're sitting on the couch, and we're looking up at the TV set. Next thing you know, there's my idea. It happens. It happens quite, quite frequently. So, right. uh, I think people are surprised that they don't have to start businesses. I think they're surprised that they can get uh, their ideas to market through licensing and just get in the game. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and as you're as you're talking here, I mean, it's sort of a perfect segue. You know, one of the things that pops into my head is that. You know, with what's happened in the economy in the last couple of years, you got you got a ton of people who are um, who are kind of moving away from larger corporate jobs, and, and they're really fascinated by the world of entrepreneurship. They'd love to have more control. They've got a ton of ideas of things to do, but they're also at the same time, a lot of people are a little further into their lives. They have responsibilities. They have you know things to do. So either they're they, they're terrified of actually putting everything at risk, and understandably so, or they need to go and get some other corporate job you know, because they've got to pay the bills. They've got to do something. They don't have the time to really think about building, but they, but they would have the time probably to just come up with cool ideas and make a couple of phone calls here and there. So it's an interesting, I think, alternative path or sort of like you know side, side path to start to play with for people who are in that place. You know, great point. There is a, these two guys that, uh, you know, they're childhood friends and they're both musicians and they both had the day jobs, the family, and they got together on their drive to work on the phone each day and talked about, let's find an opportunity. And sure enough, they came up with the traditional egg shaker. They, they, they changed the shape and they made different layers in there. So it had all these different sounds. And they ended up licensing it to the largest percussion company in the world. And now the product's everywhere. But they did it without quitting their day job. They found something they were passionate about, and that was music. Mm -hmm. And so now they've got the second career, which they're really excited about, and seeing the smile on their face. So I, I tell everybody, don't do, don't, don't get crazy here. Find something that you love. But there's one thing I want to mention too. I don't even think you need an idea. Really? Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> right. But but you need have you you need to you need to, you need to find ideas. All right, but you don't have to have one. And I'll give you a great example. I went down to this college of uh, art design in Pasadena, one of the premier schools of art design, 12 di disciplines of, of design. And they have these galleries. I walked in where the students have a, they change it up every semester. And you walk in and you look at the creativity. It's very expensive to go to these schools. This is the top talent in the country. And I walked in. And, and a professor brought me in because he wanted to have me teach them about licensing because they all thought that they had to start a company or work for somebody else. But when I looked at all these ideas, they were remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I asked, what happens to all these ideas? And he said, they throw them away at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, why wouldn't, they, why wouldn't they produce sell sheets, little YouTube videos, before and after, start showing it to companies right away. And a light clicked on, and, and I'm working with that group down there now. So so if I was starting out, and, and I like calling people, 
right? And I'm in, let's say I'm in sales, and there's a few of us that like to talk. So let's say I'm in sales, and I understand companies are looking for ideas. Thousands are. And I understand there's all this creative talent over here that maybe they don't like to pick up the phone, but they want to stay creative. Why wouldn't I bring the two together and be a connector? We talk about that also in the book, of how to be a licensing agent. So I, I think there's opportunities for people that, you know, maybe maybe you're not creative, but you know where to find those great ideas and bring them to those companies. Right. Yeah. You know, when, when you were saying, it makes so much sense to me. It's funny, when you were saying that, um, it, it's something like a completely parallel thing popped in my head, which is when I was starting a business, I ended up in the media a lot. And everyone's saying, you must have insane connections, you must be... And, and, I, and I said, no, actually, what, what I realized really early on is that the media... Or actually, it's not hard to get into magazines and newspapers and all these things. It's actually very easy. All you have to do is come up with something really cool and different. And they're desperate for those ideas. You know, the, the, the problem is that 99% of everything that they pitch is garbage. It's rehashed stuff. So it's kind of, it sounds like a similar scenario where you've got all these companies and they would kill for really cool ideas. Yeah. Your job is to either come up with or find and then sort of yes. you know, be in the middle of those ideas. And it's changed. It used to be just the toy industry, novelty gift industry that had that attitude, hey, we like freelance designers. But now, even the large guys, uh, like Procter & Gamble, the list goes on, Kraft, everybody, if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, embrace open innovation, they, will, they won't be competitive. So imagine all these companies around the world are looking for ideas. And you see that opportunity, and some of them even put what they're looking for. So all you'd have to do is, is find an area you love, make that relationship with those companies. Say, look, I'm going to bring ideas to you, my own, and the 50 of the other, other of my friends here. Yeah, right. And just start sending them in and let them do the work. See, the thing about if, you're, if you become a so-called licensing agent, let's say, or an expert, you, you make the guys that are coming up with the ideas to do all the work, the sell sheets, everything. All you do is connect it with the companies. And I think you're going to see more people doing that because it is fun. Innovation, I mean, we don't make anything in the United States basically anymore. But we do control the in innovation stream here. It's because of those ideas. So you, you can play. And you can play from your home office. Right. So I, I want to wrap this up and be respectful of your time. This, I, I, I could keep asking you questions for a long time just because I'm fascinated. I'm, my head is spinning. I'm thinking there's so many things that I want to try now. Um, but um, you, you for a long, I, I know for a long time, had been teaching this course, and it's a higher ticket course, and maybe you're still teaching it. Um, but one, one of the cool things, and you brought it up a couple of times, um, is that you have a book out now also, which essentially is like this you know, it, tremendous roadmap to doing all these things, what you're saying. What's, tell me, just talk to me for a minute or two, like, what's, what's the book about? Why did you actually go bring a book to market on this? Well, I, I asked you when, they, when, <laughs> when uh, McGraw-Hill had contacted me, and they said, Steve, you, you, you've been teaching this for 10 years, and you're still actively involved in licensing, and why don't you come up with the book? And I remember I called you and, and some other friends and said, look, why do I need a book? And we talked about it. And I decided, why don't I take the, the, what I've been doing for 30 years, what I've been teaching for 10, and put everything in a book. And my partner thought I, would, I, I was crazy to take the 10 steps and put everything in the books, because I sell a very expensive course. But I think it was you and some other people told me, so, you know, see, if you write a book, write it like it's your last. Mm -hmm. and, we, I, and I did that. It was, it was, I think it was a very good idea, because it, it lays out those 10 steps that I've been teaching. Very, it's a very easy read. It's packed with information. It's real information that I'm using today myself even. So it's not like something I've done years ago. My students are doing it and it does work. So I'm very proud of it. It's called One Simple Idea. It basically shows you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Anybody can do it. Follow my 10 steps and you'll be surprised how you can get your ideas into the biggest companies in the world in the world to look at your ideas and how to protect it, play the game, and, and get involved very quickly. So yes. That's awesome. And, and for everybody watching, I will, um, probably down here somewhere, I'll, I'll throw a link up to uh, the book and a link up to Steven's website and stuff like that so you guys can find him. Um, 
he's always been incredibly gracious to me and sort of you know, answering questions. Um, and one of the few people that I know that actually doesn't just teach on this, um, but actually has been living and breathing it. I mean, you've been doing this, like you said, for 30 years. And um, I love learning from people who didn't learn how to do it from somebody else, but who actually do it <laughs> on a daily basis. You know, they didn't take a course in it and then figured out, okay, this is cool. I can make some money, you know, repurposing and teaching. But you've like been out there doing it for a couple of decades now. That's, that's the person that I always love to find. So it's, it's always, it's fun for me you know, to learn from you, and, I, and I'm actually pretty psyched to, uh, to help, um, you know, to, 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 to bring you and introduce you to a whole bunch of other people through, uh, through your work and your book and stuff like that, so, um, and I th I th so thank you so much for your time, it's been really great, it's, I always learn, like, you know, we've talked about these things a whole bunch of times, but every time I have a conversation, I learn more, and there's, I'm like, oh, I missed that last time, so it's great for me. Well, and, thank you. All right, and uh, I, I will talk to you soon. All right, Jonathan, thank you very much.